to the you start getting to the age where you wish you had half of their energy and a quarter of their energy. Exactly. Hey, Darren. Hey, Brandy. Hi. Hello. Hi, Gerald. Haven't seen you in a while. It has been a while. How are you? Good. Good. We're just talking about our Thanksgivings. Yeah. Was it a good one? I hope. It, it was good. I was busy. We we volunteer. It's kind of a family tradition. Now we volunteer in the morning, early afternoon. Oh yeah. And I don't, I don't think anyone in the family had, had more than four or five hours sleep the last few days. So we volunteer. <laughs> we ate, and everybody took a nap. <laughs> so, That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Good times. Oh, so you two are on today. <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, yeah how excited are you about that <laughs> i'm excited about that <laughs> i'm ambivalent <laughs> I, I don't usually talk about myself a lot so i was hoping nobody would show up but then i wanted people to show up i'm kind of the hey, same way, Gerald. i don't you know this, I, i'm more I'm, I'm maximizing others i'm not maximizing me <laughs> <laughs> So today, um, <clears throat> you, as you guys can see, Darren and Gerald are going to be talking to us about their strengths. Um, so what they share in their top five is the responsibility maximizer. Uh, but what is really interesting is when we look at their top 10 and we see that they actually share an abundance of strengths, learner, futuristic, responsibility, maximizer, relator, individualization. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, so we will we will come back to that. Um, but for now, let's have um, each of you guys just share, you know, who you are, where you started in life, what what your journey's been, where you ended up today. Um, you know, you can share how we met if you'd like. And I just want everybody to just get a good understanding of who we're talking to and what you're about. And I know you guys have both. Um, you know, if you have websites you want me to bring up during, you know, and show while you're talking to, I'm happy to do that. If you want me to navigate to a site that you have, because I think Gerald, you have a website, um, if I remember correctly. So, so Gerald, do you want to go first and just share a little bit about yourself with everybody? Sure. Um, well, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Gerald McAdoo, um, born and raised uh, in the Midwest in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, although I've been here nearly 30 years. Uh, so I guess in the words of Zig Ziglar, I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could. Um, I am an engineer by trade, electrical engineering. So I'm very uh, task oriented. I've kind of learned over time to compartmentalize my mind. Um, but again, I'm, I'm an engineer, uh, did that for a couple years before going back to uh, graduate school in business. Um, that's actually what brought me to, to Texas is after that, I switched from engineering to more business, actually investment, investment management, uh, institutional investment management, and then switched over to uh, managing high net worth individuals and families, uh, did that for a decade and a half. Um, Separately, but overlapping that time frame, uh, invested in uh, commercial real estate. Uh, wife and I have been doing that for 20 years. Um, had various entrepreneurial um, you know, endeavors, uh, various levels of success, um, and then kind of settled on, on what we do now. Uh, and now we work with uh, small and mid-sized business owners and helping them just discover existing cash in their business to, you know, one, just put cash back in their pocket, uh, two, for them to reinvest in their business. And then for those that are quite successful, uh, help reduce their tax burden. So we operate on all levels uh, of business owners there. And is it, so you said you and your wife run this together? Well, this is mine, but in terms of the uh, investing in real estate, we've oh, been doing okay. it together over 20 years. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do you guys have questions for Gerald? What brought you to Texas, Gerald? I don't think I've ever heard that story. 
Well, being in Michigan, you know it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> Five, six months of, of snow and ice. And, uh, you know, I was always the youngest legs in the house. So I got to shovel snow, uh, you know, multiple times a day, come back and throw salt on that. So I'd had enough of that. And I took, um, I guess we had a conference here in the Dallas area. And I came, it was uh, early November that we came and it was still warm outside. And I said, I just can't believe people live like this. <laughs> so <laughs> after graduation, I took my position here in Dallas. Uh, one, for the weather. Uh, I didn't know anyone here. But again, for the position, I, I switched to financial services and got involved in uh, trust and estate investment management and joined, uh, I guess when I joined, it was NCNB. Uh, they called it no cash for nobody. But by the time I arrived, it was Nations Bank. And uh, that's why I started managing institutional monies. So that, that's really what brought me here, in addition to the weather. So Lions fan or Cowboys fan? Well, both. At the time, they wore the same color, so I couldn't really lose. I grew up on the Cowboys and Tom Landry and Billy White shoes and all that, so I loved the Cowboys. Uh, but the Lions always happened to beat them the first few years here. So I got a chance to kind of, you know, dig my coworkers for that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Did you cheer Michigan this weekend? I did not. How did they do? Didn't they play Ohio State? I missed oh. it. That was a big game. I was exhausted. I missed it. Yeah, Michigan. Oh, they crushed them. Michigan crushed Ohio State? Yep. yep. Oh, all right. Go Blue. Go Blue. <laughs> I'm a fan. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Darren, your turn, buddy. All right. Well, hello, everybody. And, and uh, thanks for inviting me to join this, Brandy. This is a great opportunity and uh, welcome to all of you. Hope you all had a nice uh, holiday. Uh, so a little bit of background on me. So what uh, what I I grew up uh, in California. I was born and raised in uh, really Visalia, born in Anaheim, Fullerton area, but really raised in Visalia. That's where I went to elementary school through high school and first semester of college. Transferred to Georgia through my father's work. Uh, so going, that was a that was a uh, that was a transfer of cultures there from California to Georgia. They're still living the Civil War down there in Georgia. And I uh, went to college in Valdosta State. Got my computer science degree. Started my career in Atlanta uh, with a telecom company called MCI Telecommunications. No longer around. Uh, they got acquired, but um, got into. Most of my career, I've been involved in telecom or software or IT services types of businesses, uh, cybersecurity, and um, probably where I really got into what I'm doing now was back in April of 98. Uh, I was working for a small telecom software business, and we got acquired. And I was uh, voluntold by my boss that, hey, I want you to run a, a functional work stream for this integration and representing the uh, sales, marketing, and professional services teams. I said, sounds great. What is that? And uh, kind of learned by uh, uh, all mistakes and learned by, uh, you know, doing, uh, particularly with that group and uh, really enjoyed that job more than I did my day job, which was a director of sales operations at the time, and I have been doing M&A integration work ever since. Uh, so kind of got built a career around that. And um I think the, the the positive sides of that is it's great work when you're working and it's not so great when you're not. And uh, But it's still a passion of mine to do that kind of work because it does, I think, leverage my ability to execute. And that's really what you'll see in my strengths profile is a lot of execution background. So that's what I do. Cool. What else? And, and I met Brandy, I guess, through Brad Stevens. Brad introduced me to Brandy. I don't know, three or four months ago, went through the strengthology uh, assessment and found it fascinating. I, I think uh, I've been through a lot of these types of assessments, Myers-Briggs, DISC, and so forth, uh, Career Direct, and so forth. And what I found interesting about this one in particular was the way it described my strengths. It described it uniquely in a way that I could actually, it helped me put together uh, really what is now uh, kind of my two-minute pitch um, verbal pitch because now everything I say is based upon those strengths and it's a little more foundational um, and, and it's helped helped me uh, communicate with others as I look for my next opportunity. So um, 
in the work that you do, um, well, that you've been doing, you know, the merger acquisition work yep. for you, let's, let's just take the responsibility maximizer strength for a minute and, and focus on those, but, or, or you can, you can do all of them. Um, but I'm just curious, like how you see yourself using those strengths to achieve um, what it is that you have to get done when you're doing mergers and acquisitions. Well, as, as, as many of you probably have witnessed in some part of your career, either, uh, or hopefully you have, um, you, you're, you've either been part of a company buying something or a company selling something. I typically work on behalf of the buyer and I typically work to integrate the businesses that the buyer has acquired. Now, it, it, and I've been on all permutations of that. I've been a consultant, I've been an employee, I've been on the sell side, I've been on the buy side. Um, and I've, so I bring a unique perspective when it comes to M&A integration because I've, I've been there and I've done it. And I've, 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 had, I've gone through all the emotions that an acquired employee goes through. It's chaotic. And uh, uh, the first thing we all learn as practitioners is that it, you gotta take care of the employees because they're the ones that take care of the customers. And so uh, you take care of the employees, they'll take care of the customers, that'll take care of the stockholders. So um, when you take care of those employees, it's, it's really taking care of about what about me? And so I feel a duty or a responsibility to make sure that I'm taking care of those employees through this process. Uh, it, it's delicate, it's sensitive, and it's critical. And so it's, it's, one of, it's my top strength, as you can see there, and I do what I say I'm going to do. Uh, so I think when when you're an acquired employee and you have a leader come up to you and say that you know they give you a commitment, um, they expect it. They expect you to meet that commitment. Well, I as the committer expect that of me too. So uh, I think I build trust that way, and I think I build uh, uh, relationships that way. And and Darren, how when did you learn like that? If you take care of the employee then the rest takes care of itself. Oh gosh, probably early in my career. Um, I, I think I learned that probably earlier than even doing M&A integration. Uh, it's just one of those things that I've, I've always had a, I don't know, I've never been an HR professional, but I've always had a bent towards that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, um, I, I just have tried to build trust-based relationships. Um, and uh, I've been a servant leader all my life. My father was a servant leader. And um, I just kind of grew up, that, that was just kind of common, commonplace around my home. Mm -hmm. I can remember my father would uh, actually, uh, when, when their company did well, he and my mom would serve a meal every single shift, uh, every quarter. And their company did really, really well. My dad could tell you every single employee in that company and everything about their, their family, he mm -hmm. knew them all. And there were hundreds of employees. Yeah. So I grew up around that, Brandy. Yeah. What, what was his, what was their company? It was more business forms at the time. Uh, it's, it's been sold a couple of times now. I think it's probably RR Donnelly at now, at, you know, through all the acquisitions that's been going on. Mm -hmm. um, so then, and then how does the maximizer come into play? Well, when you're in this one, I probably did pick up in uh, when I was doing uh, M&A integration work because you really got to have the right people in the right seats on the bus. Mm -hmm. You really have to understand what drives people. And when you're trying to work with those acquired employees, you want to engage them as fast as you can, because the more they get engaged, the more they buy in to the process and methodology that you're employing on them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that's one, one thing that helped me realize that, hey, the more I can leverage what people value and what they, what they're, what's important to them, um, the more that they're going to perform for me and with me. And so do you do like interviews, just, just go around and talk to people? Like, how do you get to know them and get to know their talents and get to know where, where their expertise is and where they should be in this transition? How, how's that work out? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of, of walking the halls. I I've always managed by walking the halls. I think you get a lot more insights when you do that. If you're stuffed in a corner office, you're not going to learn about the business that you will when you're talking to people uh, that are on the ground floor in the ditches uh, yeah. work work. So I've always, I've always tried to build those relationships. Uh, and, and I'll tell you the, the people that have the most information, are the ones that are doing it every day. <laughs> yeah. And they, and then like, do you just feel like it doesn't take you very long? Like within 
you know, 30 minutes of talking to someone or even less, you kind of know exactly. I can, I can get a sense for what people are all about in 30 minutes, probably 45 mm -hmm. minutes for sure. And, and then how do you make them feel like you have heard them, like that they're understood, that they, um, that you clearly understand, like, you know, we, cause, cause someone can say, okay, um, this person thinks they know me and they at least tried, but they don't. But how, how do you know that, that people feel like, ah, oh, this guy totally gets it. And he really, he really knows who I am and what I'm about, what I'm trying to do here. I, I go back for feedback. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a feedback loop that I try to employ. Um, it's either through employee surveys or it's just through a personal conversation saying, mm -hmm. you know, I remember you mentioning this particular thing and, and uh, this is the, the action that I took on that. Did that, did that address ah. your concern or your, your challenge or your um, thought? <clears throat> and usually you get pretty honest feedback from employees. Got it. So, so you actually try to take action on something they've said right away to build that trust. It may not be right away because it may be something that's more challenging, but yeah, I do try to take, I, I at least note it. And I take, I try to make sure that it's certainly in an M&A integration. I try to make sure that it's incorporated into the integration plan in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. A lot of times M&A integration is about culture uh, and culture is a, is a big issue, right? If you've got two companies coming together, they have different cultures, they will, they will be challenged. There's yeah. no question about it. Uh, so the, the faster that you uh, get to the cultural flashpoints that I call them, mm. uh, you know, where, where people have uh, different buying processes or different approval processes or different way they do meetings or how they set up their agendas in meetings. I mean, those are all cultural. It, it, you know, I, I make the analogy, it's much like a uh, family dinner. Uh, one family's dinner is totally different than another family's dinner. Yeah. And how they go about that. It's a culture. Right. Yeah. So, so you try to understand that culture and you try to bring the best of, of both to the end game or what we call NUCO in that case. Yeah. yeah. And get, just getting everybody aligned on what the new, the new norm is. Yep. And being honest, transparent with people. Right. Mm -hmm. I think when you build transparency in, in doing this type of work, um, it, it, uh, it goes a long way. People may not necessarily like what you have to say, but they'll always um, respect and appreciate honesty and transparency. Got it. Do you guys have questions, thoughts for Darren? Not yet. I love the term cultural flashback. <laughs> Say again? I love the term you use, the phrase you use, the cultural flashback. Cultural flashpoint? Yeah. Flashpoint, that's it. That's fantastic. And it's true, it's very difficult to, to, for, for many to gain trust and to gain it quickly. It sounds like it really worked out in your favor. Well, it, it starts at the top. So once you get the, the leaders to, to buy into the methodology and the process and the approach, uh, typically their, their subordinates will fall in line. But, it, you know, it, it's, you got to get the leadership on board. If you got a naysayer, it's probably time to think about whether that naysayer needs to be involved in the program at all. Kim, were you going to say something too? I was just going to say um, the top 10 really gives a more uh, complete picture of Darren because having uh, chatted with him multiple times, I would say that he's very relational and relationship driven. And when you were showing just the top five before, I was like, how does he not have any rela like relationship? But there, it's all in the, the bottom five there. Yep. So it's, yeah. Uh, and I, I think, um, I think Maximizer has also got some relational in it that doesn't really show up on this particular graph. Um, and then also like the arranger can be, it can be, it can have to do with people, but it can also not just depending on what else is surrounding the, that strength. And because he does have the relationship building um, from about five down, then his arranger is going to arrange people and get them in the right spot and get them doing what they do best every day, um, which people like, you know, we're all drawn to being arranged in the right arrangement. Um, so so yeah, you're probably feeling a little bit of those nuances too, of the combinations of his strengths. Yep. And then, you know, obviously with that individualization and maximizer combination, 
like you're really, really interested in how do I interact with someone in the way that they need to be interacted with to engage them? And then how do I maximize that? How do I take that to the next level very quickly? Um, so, so just those being right at five and six is going to make a huge difference. Exactly. When you talk to Darren, when you talk to Darren, you, you feel like you're the only person in the room he's mm. talking to. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that he's interested, like it's, he has that, <laughs> like he has your full attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he genuinely is probably very interested in you in that moment. Is that, is that how you feel Darren? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they've got to be the spotlight at the moment I'm talking to them. Mm -hmm. I, I hate distractions. You know, that's the one thing I, I I dislike the most is distractions because that that prevents me from being able to have those those conversations like I want to have. So I really have to work at not getting distracted. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's interesting that you say that because arrangers are usually great with uh, juggling five, 10, 15, 25 things all at once. But the discipliner is usually not right. It's the clear the distractions, um, be very efficient. Uh, arrangers want to be efficient too, but they're they're better, way better at juggling than discipline. Discipline's like structured. Here's the calendar. Here's the plan, and we're gonna we're gonna follow it through through a regiment. So, but what you just said was that you don't like distractions, but you 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 could potentially get distracted. So you have to really work to. Not yeah, I, I do have to, I, I have to, that's something I do work at. I, I work at trying to manage the distractions. I can manage them, but yeah. I, I have to be conscientious about it. I can't, it's not, it's not something I flippantly do. Got it. I think that I gotta, I gotta be conscientious about. Mm -hmm. Cause I can get pulled in a lot of different directions very quickly. That's part of that responsibility. Uh, it's one of the weaknesses I think you'll see. And when you read the responsibility is that you can, you got to make sure you're looking at your task list and what you've already committed to do before you commit to something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, and I, I think it's the arranger, Darren, I think arrangers. So they juggle 25 things so well that they're just going to, and you know, when you've got responsibility arranger, you're going to be like, yes, 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 yes. You're going to say yes to all those things. Um, because you have to be responsible and you juggle well. So you're just going to say yes to everything. And then, you know, you're just going to, you're just going to maneuver it. God forbid I do that. Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're in the, you're in the, I mean, merger acquisition, right? I mean, you're in the right area to actually maximize that. It's, it's, it, it's probably the most complex program management job you'll ever yeah. find on the planet. Yeah. It's, it just seems terribly complex with, especially with the people element. That's usually the one that's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's pretty easy to manage logistics, even if they're complex, but pe that people stuff, whoo, that's a whole nother ball game. Yep. Um, Andy, quick question on that. Cause I know oh, yeah. both of these guys, well, does Darren, yeah. does, and kind of track it back to what Kim was talking about. Does Darren not have focus anywhere in there? Cause it's he not can yeah, no, you're, I think what you're experiencing is discipline because discipline and focus, like to us on the outside, they look a lot alike. So focus needs a goal. And then they just laser focus on that goal. They beeline towards it. They get rid of distractions. Um, and they are really efficient and they talk really fast. And it's just all about the goal. What's the goal? What's the goal? What's the goal? And they just get rid of all the other distractions and they're extremely efficient. So you may think Darren has focus, but what you may be seeing is his discipline <clears throat> because discipline is let's take everything, let's map it out on the schedule, let's come up with the plan and then let's just follow it. We're not going to step off and do this and this and this and this and this and that. This is what we're trying to do. This is where we're trying to go. Here's the plan here. Here's the schedule. And then we're just, this is what we said we were going to do, which is the responsibility. So then let's just follow through and do all these things as planned efficiently. Um, so, so people will get those two confused. They'll think someone has focus or discipline. Um, so what, what you have to ask or kind of, um, feel out is, are they focused on a goal? Like, is everything about the goal, the goal, the goal, the goal, or is it just about planning and scheduling and, um, you know, making sure all the meetings are in place and, and we're, you know, we're being disciplined towards that. It's, it's hard to figure out which one of those they have because they feel so similar in the results, but they kind of, the discipline doesn't necessarily have to have a fixed goal 
that they just stay towards and we just have to meet that goal no matter what. Uh, focus can get like like um, tunnel vision focused on that goal um, where discipline just gets a little irritated that the schedule has been, you know, uh, shifted and we have to redo everything to make it efficient again. Um, where a ranger, his arranger is also efficiency focused, but it's it's very flexible. It's just like, oh, this changed. Well, we're going to do this now. Oh, this changed. Now we're going to do this. Now we're going to reschedule this. And, the, you know, so it's got a, he's got a mix of discipline and that flexible arranger. Okay. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like Dan is just fine, but perfect field to be in. I mean, as you look at this chart, he's very strategic focus, perfectly balanced with relationship building, perfectly balanced with executing, and then he's going to focus on maximizing all those key assets together. Yeah, and it got enough influence to be able to get people to do what they need to be doing to be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Darren, anything to add to what I just said about the focus versus the discipline versus a ranger? Yeah, I would say the only thing I would say maybe to just clarify that or better add some color is I don't focus on necessarily the goal per se. Mm -hmm. I focus on the approach and the methodology that we've all agreed to and bought into. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that in, in M&A particularly, or even cross-functional programs in general, there's going to be things that come up. Um, you, you can't, you can't, uh, it's kind of like a contract. You're never going to have a contract that covers every single scenario. Likewise, you're never going to have a plan that covers every single scenario that can come up. Yeah. So you have to you have to have the flexibility to be able to adjust uh, and and manage that accordingly. But I, if you have a, an approach and a methodology and the tools and templates to manage that process, that's what I focus on. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, let's switch over to Gerald. Gerald, um, if you could just share with us a little bit about your responsibility maximizer. It's your number one, number two. So how does that kind of play out for you in your world? Wow, um, so I'm just I'm learning more uh, about this and how this works. Um, do, you, do you have a sense of high responsibility towards your clients, your business, your family? I, I think it's been a part of me and probably instilled in me from the beginning. Uh, so much so that I've, you know, you grew up in that environment. My uh, parents are small business owners. I've been a small business owner. I've worked with, you know, business owners. Um, it was always kind of head down, do the work and others will eventually recognize, you know, your work. Um, so much so that I was told I needed to do a better job in marketing myself. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. I had to look up what that term was. Um, and years ago, uh, and just to tell you how bad that was then, uh, when I switched to the investment markets, when I came to Texas, I was managing portfolios and we had a group out in Charlotte that was looking at the investment results of all the portfolio managers on a national basis. And one of my friends who was working in that group came to me, showed me a report and said, Gerald, do you know you're in the top 20% of investment performance of all the portfolio managers across the country? And you're in the top three in DFW. You need to tell somebody about this. As I, I'm not comfortable doing that. They'll, they'll eventually figure it out. Well, how are they going to figure that out? Mm -hmm. um, but of all of that, it, it's been focus on the results, focus on the people. You know, if I commit to something, if I'm there to help, then I'm there to help. And I'm going to do whatever I can to help, you know, help that individual, help that person, whatever it is I'm committed to. Probably been, in, that's been instilled in me as a family. Um, but as this is showing, it's kind of a natural characteristic, I guess, that I've carried through, sometimes to an extreme, you know, as I mentioned. And are you attracted to certain clients because you feel like you can personally help them? With, with your own um, background and experiences? Oh, absolutely. I think I, I, I listen for and gravitate to those that I can help and assist. And if, if I say that I'm going to help, I'm going to do everything I can to help. Um, yeah, because usually Maximizer has a little filter, right? It's like, I can't maximize everybody, but for whatever reason, I can maximize you, you, and you. So you are the three that I'm going to make a commitment to and help. 
Uh, absolutely. And some of that comes out is I think one of the reasons I, I picked up on uh, Darren's term, uh, cultural flashpoint, is I'm, I've always been very interested in other people. I think to this day, uh, even friends that have known me from high school, I probably know a lot more about them than they know about me because I find them so interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so it is like I, if, if I find something out about you, I'm really interested. I'm, I love people. I'm engaged in what they're doing. Uh, kind of like this is I love figuring out the ends and inner workings of people and what their motivations and interests are. And if I can help, I want to be able to help. Uh, but it's one of the things is, it, and I'm kind of torn between this, is, you know, you want to focus on what your strengths are. And you don't want to do too much because you can, you know, hopefully get a better performance out of those key things of what your strengths are. And I've had both experiences. And I don't know if I've been trained out of one and into the other. Uh, but I remember in, in engineering school, first year there, you know, smart, had no study skills, <laughs> went to college, did not perform well. And the director of engineering pulled several of us together who were in that same boat and said, I want you guys to get more active. Join this, grab a position here. And we said, don't we need to concentrate more on our studies? And what we found, all of us found, was very different, that the more things we were involved in, it focused us on what were the most important things to get done in those categories. We didn't have time to waste. So we all became more active in the collegiate community. Uh, we all had better grades because we all had to focus on what our strengths actually were and focus on some of those things. Um, yeah, and when I look at your strengths, I say, okay, he's got <clears throat> this connectedness, which means you have the innate ability to connect with all walks of life um, because you find everybody necessary to the bigger picture, right? We're all connected. Um, but at the same time, you know, with the maximizer, it's like, but, but it's like, I could see where you have this inner struggle of who, who do I spend time with? Who do I help? Um, who do I maximize or where do I, where do I maximize? Because I also feel connected to everybody in some way. Um, so it's like this push and pull dichotomy that I, that I'm assuming that you have going on internally. Yeah. It makes me focus on uh, the bottleneck. So, you know, growing up in Michigan, working at Ford Motor Company, doing the Edward Demi movement, quality is job one. Uh, and then, you know, kind of the engineering, technical, analytical mind that I tend to have, you know, you, you can see issues and quality issues all over the place, but you mm. focus on where the bottom it is. So I do find myself gravitating from one, you know, all on the spectrum. You can see their opportunities to improve, their opportunities to help and to be of assistance. But where can I make the most impact now? Yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, and then the relator is like kind of the opposite of that, right? Because relator is like, I just want to have people that are like me closest to me. That's my inner circle is the people that I relate with. So you would relate well with other connectedness people, other maximizers, other responsible people, other strategy people. So you're going to relate most with those types of people, the ones that are a little more similar. However, you have this ability to connect with all walks of life and you value that. And you have individualization, which is the interest in the differences, in the unique people, in the things that are not like you. So you kind of have an interesting push and pull scenario going on with your, your relational strengths. And then the maximizer again is like, all right, but <laughs> you know, I want to spend most of my time with people that I can maximize either them or with, you know, as partners um, or as clients. And so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's probably for you and belief is also help, helping serve like the underserved, right? People who need help. And so you've got this dichotomy of like, I need to help everybody. <laughs> I need to help the people who can't help themselves. I need to people help the people that, um, are more than capable, but I want to maximize them and I relate most with them. Um, yet I want to help, you know, everybody because everybody is a part of the global picture. So I could see where that is just always an inner, you know, discussion with yourself of who should I be helping when, at what point, um, how, how do you decide? How do you, do you have any sort of decision-making 
process that you go through to really make those decisions at certain points of time? Well, you've described my life. I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> taken a long time to get to where I am today. Um, in terms of decision making, what I've learned, um, probably with age <laughs> now too, now and experience is, um, I guess in the beginning I was um, very um, determined. Um, you know, you want to do a little bit of, of everything. Uh, over time, I've learned now, primarily with you know raising kids now, is a lot of times when I look at them and see areas that need to be improved, most of the time it's something in myself that needs to be improved. You know, if you're pointing at someone else, there's several fingers pointing back at yourself. So it's made me more um, compassionate mm -hmm. and understanding uh, of others. Um, in terms of the decision making now and also kind of with age, it's more of looking at where are all the different areas, as you're saying, where are all the areas that I could maybe make an impact, maybe I could help and be of some assistance. And looking at ways that it will impact more of my life so that there's a better result for all of us. All right. So those that I'm in business and in partner with, they're also my friends. Mm. You know, it, you know how we met. We met through Brad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our advisory group grown very close to them over the past couple of years, and you know Brad brought you into to our life. Mm -hmm. well, we've gone from being you know just a business advisory group to being friends. Yeah, that's that's huge. Now I can impact not just one but multiple areas of my life and have impact to all of those. So that point, I really look. I'm I'm starting to pay more attention with the time I do have, the impact I can make, what I can commit. Where is it going to make the most the most impact in my life? Yeah, and I and I can hear you saying something else that you haven't verbalized yet, but it's like because you see how everything is connected, um, you start to to realize that when you're impacting um, a particular person that happens to be your friend or your client or you know or and 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 right, um, but also like I think there's something in there that says that you also see the impact that they're making. So if you're impacting them and impacting them positive, there's this ripple effect of what, how they're out there impacting the world as well, which I think you're connected with. Um, even though I didn't hear you say that, <laughs> is that, Absolutely. is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. If I can help, you know, if I help one and that one helps two others, then yeah. we can help three, not exactly. just one. Absolutely. Yeah. And so on and so on. Right. Um, any questions or thoughts for Gerald as you guys are listening? You're so complex, Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told that by my wife. <laughs> I, I see that firsthand. Gerald wants to help everybody. Like when we're talking about snapshot business services, he's like, well, I can help real estate. I can help business owners. I can help like, and the list goes on and on that it's like, he wants to reach everyone. Yeah. It's Which I, I think he will eventually, right. Or as many as he can while he's here, um, on this earth, because I think he's drawn to doing that. Right. If we can impact this group or these people, then why not? Let's do it. Do you ever have a sense, Gerald, that you need to prioritize who you help first? Oh, absolutely. And it you know, it's the ripple effect that comes from that. Uh, and that's part of what I, what I hope to do is to, to make a ripple. You, know, you make one ripple, but that ripple affects others. So if I can help one and that one introduces me to several others, then yeah, I look at that over time. As opposed to helping one, how do I help a, a bulk of people, mass qualities? But yeah, it gets difficult to focus. And I, I'm learning to um, rely on help you know, learning what my strengths are and, you know, what some of those weaknesses are, shortcomings, things that I don't do very well. And there are many, there are plenty of folks, um, how to get help for some of those things. That's actually one of the questions I have is, you know, as you begin to, um, you know, hire or engage people based on their expertise, it's not yours. How do you manage or maybe prepare, how do you prepare for those, some of, some of those transitions? What's the best way to do that? Well, along that train of thought, Brandy, I'm sure you're going to put them side by side. On Let's the do it. Yeah. But one thing I 
think Theron has that doesn't show up in Gerald's is a ranger. Is that part of what Gerald is, the gap is there compared to how Darren can arrange everybody? Well, they both have what if thinking because a ranger does what if thinking, right? What if this, what if that, what if this? And they move things around on a tactical level, on an operational level, um, where strategic also does that, but only at a big picture level. So it's looking at the overall big picture. It's going, what if this, what if that, what if this, what if that? Well, if this and this and this and that. So if I'm going to get from point A to point B the most efficiently, then I just need to do this. And it's just more of an intuitive big picture where the arranger is a little bit more in it and actually moving stuff around and they're learning where things need to go and what the priority is as they're moving things around, as they're taking action or executing. So they both have it. It's just different, a different way of coming at it. Okay. I'm looking, see if there's anything else I see there. Darren's also got big picture thinking at number seven with his futuristic. So he's, um, the way he's approaching big picture is he's dreaming and envisioning what this could look like, what this could be five, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, he can paint that picture for others so that they can also then aim, you know, all their efforts towards that, towards that future vision. Um, but I, I think if I compare the two, I would say Darren has more priority setting strengths with he also has the discipline the analytical um, and the arranger so he's probably his brain is probably doing a little bit more of that naturally where gerald's probably tapping into that um mostly through his strategic um a little responsibility can get there it's just that normally responsibility will take on too much because they love to say yes to responsibilities. And then they have to ba you know, backpedal and say, well, that was too much. <laughs> and they have to learn to say no to things. And it's hard for them to say no, because of course, if they say yes, they're, they're going to do it and they're going to be depended on and get it done and get it over the finish line. Um, so then it's, they have to learn to just go, you know what, this is not my responsibility. This is someone else's responsibility and let it go. Um, and only say yes to the things that they really think they should be engaged in and doing. So I think with maturity, the responsibility can actually do it, but it's just not natural for them in the beginning. You have that right on the money. I've had to learn that over time and I actually have a button on my desk that says no. <laughs> <laughs> and that's 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 for business i have to you know verbally and visually see that as well as for the family yeah <laughs> when i it's read that i thought it said on <laughs> no <laughs> how does that show up in the camera <laughs> hey, i thought it was the easy button <laughs> um what else do we see here when we compare these two guys? Anything else that's interesting to y'all? Hey, Brandy, I sensed uh, the harmony coming through with Darren. Uh huh. This is the strategic with Gerald. Yeah. What did What did you sense? How did you pick up on that? Well, D Darren is more about finding how people fit and how everything fits together in a better, harmonious way. Yeah. And uh, where Gerald is more strategic and about what he's done and how he does things. I don't know. There's just a, a little bit of contrast there. Yeah. Yep. Darren has a lot of co like pull all these people in, right? Collaboratively to get everyone doing what they need to be doing. Talks about uh, getting buy-in and harmoniously. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Where and I think Gerald is on his way to doing more of that you know this this whole like maximized connectedness piece and with individualization at number eight i think in and even with relator it's like in the long run i think he will be starting to go oh you know this partner and this partner and this person and this and it's all connected and, and seeing how all of it is working together to produce this result and you probably do that naturally gerald um, but you're probably just, 
you know, in that phase of learning strengths and starting to articulate it that way, because you probably couldn't have gotten to where you are today without being able to see how, and you've got the architecture mind, right? You're an electrical engineer. So you're, you're connecting all the dots naturally. Um, but a lot of times strategic have a hard time articulating it because it's all happening in your mind and you can see it and you can see how it all fits together. But to, to say it to other people is, it's like, how do you say that? Right. How do you say <laughs> that all of this is connected and it's all, you know, it's like a circuit board, right? It's all connected. It's all firing and it's all coming together to produce a result, but difficult to, to wrap that up in a few sentences that, that other people can comprehend. No, that's a hundred percent. Um, years ago, another test, I uh, found out that I am an abstract con concrete thinker. So I can see the picture. I see the connected, I see the dots, but communicating that to someone else is exactly the issue I'm work to try to solve mm -hmm. uh, um, exactly right with you know putting people and processes together mm -hmm. so my mind very process in terms of the business that process works really well now it's around myself personally how to become more productive that's exactly where the focus is now so you know the things that Darren does um, you know more directly very process driven um, mm -hmm. I'm learning the benefit of that and learning to, you know, really work on those processes for around myself personally. This is why, well, but personally is, is, is where my focus is, has been recently. What's, what's something I released in this tool that's kind of interesting you guys might all like is let's go to strength rank really quick. If I was wanting to look at you guys as a group, and this is just looking at top five, um, but if I was wanting to see like, are you guys process oriented? I, I now have a drop down that y'all can select here on your strength ranks. Um, where's the process one? This is really a cool tool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm loving it. I can't wait to just continue to improve it over time. You guys are all kind of the pilot on this. Is it second to the bottom? Oh, thank you. Um, so what we see here is okay, if, if we're really wanting to, to focus on the process itself, um, it's mainly going to be my strategic arranger and discipline. And so after you guys know, then this piece is Gerald. And then this piece, these two would be um, Darren. And then also I might get a bit, a little bit of process thinking or efficiencies or, you know, sort of that priority through the, through the responsibility maximizer. Um, what I, what I need to do, I think, is gray out some of these other ones on this particular graph for the group setting because um, they don't they don't don't really mean anything. Um, but that's how we as a team, if I if you guys are on the same team, you could think about how are we going to. Um, you know, you know, I'd be going, OK, Gerald needs to come up, help come up with that overall strategic big picture plan or direction of where we're going to go. And then Darren's going to come in with, like he said, the frameworks with the arranger and the discipline to put, make sure that we achieve that strategic plan. Pretty, pretty interesting, right? To look at it that way. Yeah, it is. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's go back again and look at this again. Let's scroll down to the bottom really quick. Let's just see. So this is obvious to me, the restorative being down here because the maximizer is up high. And if y'all recall, maximizer and restorative are opposite ends of the spectrum. They're literally paired together in a person's top five strengths, 0% of the time per Gallup. So that just means below 0.5% of the time. So they're just completely opposite. Maximizer trying to, they're looking for top performers, high performers, and then taking them to the next level, making them elite, elite making them reach levels of excellence where restorative is just looking for the problems and wanting to solve the problems and dig into the problems and, you know, enjoys the complexity of problems and fixing issues. And that's not really um, the focus for Gerald or Darren. We see woo nice and low, which makes me think relator is high for both of them. Let's look. We, we, yes, relator is high for both of them. So relator is the deep relationships off, you know, really getting to the vulnerabilities of people um, and, and creating those long-term relational bonds where the woo is just like, let me just 
Let me win you over and then let me move to the next person and win that one over and move to the next person and win that one over. So they'll win a hundred people over to their cause, their services, their products, a very, very salesy approach um, where the relators are just relishing in the deep one-on-one relationship quality time stuff. That's interesting. Their context is really low for both of them. Yep. Context is really low, which tells us what, Brad? Futuristic is possibly high. Yep. Because futuristic is that opposite of context. So when we look, we go, yep, we've got futuristic at seven and nine, which is thinking about the future and thinking forward and everything to come where the context is thinking back there, the history, what just happened and studying the past. What's Tad, you, of adaptability? Tad, you said adaptability is really low for them, which you know, with Darren, he's going to fight that a little bit because he's got that arranger. So he's going, well, I'm flexible because he's got a ranger, which is that flexible organization um, where Gerald might be like, yeah, I kind of want things to go the way I want them to go. <laughs> like, this is the plan and this is where we need to go. And I don't really want to, you know, uh, if something changes and we have to, okay, but I might, you know, I might be a little frustrated with the plan changing. It kind of reminds me of that and, and whoa, uh, I always told my wife if she if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I love that. So, Brandy, it's not obvious to me, but when you look at the 34 categories, does every single one of them have an opposite? Yes, they they do. And what the way that we know this is because we look at the data, right? So when you look at the data, you can see. Um, how often a, a strength is paired with another strength how, or how unoften it is paired with another strength. And so, a, mm -hmm. so do you have a table that shows what each of these categories opposite is? I do. I don't have the table in the tool, but I'd be happy to send you that table so you can see I mean, it. I'd be interested in seeing that. Yeah. Yep. So what does it mean when they both have low on includer? What does that mean? That just means that neither one of them are, are thinking about who they've forgotten, who's been left out. They're not thinking about making sure that everyone feels included. And that is very opposite of maximizer, right? Maximizer is, and relators, they're both a little exclusive um, because you need to be high performing to be a part of my group, or I need to be able to relate to you to be a part of my group where the includer is like, no, everybody, everybody just needs to be included. Everybody needs to feel like they're a part of the group and a part of the community. They need to feel accepted. Um, and they just, um, I did an escape room with an includer on Friday night and she could sense her number one was included. She could sense who was being left out. And she immediately, her priority was not to win the game. Her priority was to make sure he felt included. <laughs> and she made sure she said, Hey, why don't you come over here and help me and included him. Um, and so that's, that's what that focus is, is of includer. So Darren and Gerald might just accidentally, not intentionally, but just accidentally forget someone. They might forget a market. They might forget um, a client that should have been included in, in the meeting invitation or whatever, because they're just, their brain's just not thinking about that proactively. So that would suggest they need somebody to help balance that out. That if, has if they need inclusion, right? If inclusion is needed, then yes, they would. They could really benefit from having an includer. Just checking. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great. It's a great question. And that would be a good partner for them as far as um, somebody who does something they don't do. But it also means it might be really hard to work with that person because they want to include everybody. And these guys are like, no, not everybody needs to be included in this meeting or in this call or in this thing. So there has to be a mutual level of respect of when is inclusion needed? When is it not? Who should be flexing what when? Demand and competition are pretty low. Yeah. Yeah, uh, connectedness is high for both. Um, well, if we have connectedness high, that's for Gerald. Co competition is usually going to be very low. Um, I, I thought that you said that uh, Gerald was trying to help all 
everybody, helping too many people yeah. and got overwhelmed. But, but that doesn't that doesn't jive with what you just said with about well, you're know. you're taking it, Gerald, that he can't be something because he doesn't have a strength, which isn't true. It's that he's doing it through a different set of strengths. Mm. So the way he's motivated is not by inclusion. It's 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 by feeling like we are all connected. It's the feeling like um, I want to help people who are underserved, who are need help, but also feeling like I need to maximize the top performers. So he has three different ways that he that of strengths that are that are activating that are then causing inclusion but it's not coming from an included fo focus like what focus uh sorry what included people focus on their motivation which is just simply to include does that make sense david i think so i was thinking in terms of let's say a uh, 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 a little league football team and you know both coaches darren and gerald want to win of course with their team and are they you know, they actually history. don't care about winning. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was thinking that. I'm just joking. Just, I'm sorry. I'm just teasing because they both they, have competition low. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was just thinking that they they go about maximizing their top performers and make sure the team wins versus including every kid. Right. But Gerald is going to want to connect with every kid with through his connectedness. If one of the kids isn't eating food, he's going to want to make sure that that kid is food and make sure they're eating. So he just has some other things that cause it, it causes people to be more included in that way. Mm -hmm. And Darren does too. Darren has a ranger. He's wanting to put people in the right spot. He's mm -hmm. wanting to have a relationship with each individual. So all of a sudden both of them might feel or look like they have includer, mm -hmm. but that's not the motivation. Their motivation is coming from a different place. And for me, I would say it depends on kind of what the goal is. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at, you know, business, there's a certain objective that needs to be reached. What are the assets that need to be in place for us to accomplish that goal? But I would tell you personally, or as my ministry, I tend to attract people that are completely different from me. Mm -hmm. And I'm they're attracted to me. I'm attracted to them. I'm very comfortable with that. But yeah, the is, it is very different. that's that's exactly what you just said because you are so comfortable with different and you're so comfortable connecting with all walks of life then that's what's attracted to you um anything else that we see that's interesting down here? ideation is really low for both y'all you guys are both more structured um ideation is highly creative highly eccentric you know it's going ting 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 it's all over the map um, you know, coming up with the inventions, right. That have never been invented before. So Brandy has just overall question in before high performance teams is your experience is the goal to find people who are uh, close and similar and similar in terms of some of their strengths, or are you looking at complete opposites where there's almost a, there is a balance among the team. So what I would, yeah, my first question would be, what kind of team are we talking about? Because if we're on an assembly line where I need every single one of those people to be having little tiny fingers and very detailed and, you know, tying little tiny knots or something on something or whatever, um, I might need people that have some similar things going on, right? And it, especially if it's like a team that is like, repetitive right repeating 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 we might need a lot of discipline type personalities to just sit there and be very detailed very disciplined and doing that thing every single day consistently over and over again so if if that's the type of team you have then it's a different type of team but in general the type of teams we all usually work with which are high functioning teams that need to do a bit of marketing and need to do a bit of you know engineering and a bit of business and a bit uh you know all the different things if it's a team that's doing a wide range of things um which most business owners that's the type of teams they need to surround themselves with then they need variety because they need to fill all the gaps that they're not thinking about so one of the questions i get all the time is what kind of strengths do I need to have to be a leader? And the answer is, you know, you are all leaders are one in 33 million. You know, we are all one in 33 million. So are leaders. 
So to be a leader, it takes a desire to be a leader um, and to lead people. But what great leaders do is they leverage their own talents to lead and they fill those gaps. And then they bring on and partner and hire other people that have other strengths to and leverage those talents all around them to get them doing all those other things around them so that they have a great team that's high functioning, doing a bunch of stuff in a very short amount of time. Because, you know, of course, if you take somebody with a particular strength that does something that you don't like, right? So if you take somebody down here that loves to solve really hard, complex problems and just likes to sit there all day long and that's what they're getting to do. It's like, for example, like a customer service person who just takes in all the complaints all day long, restorative people thrive on that. Um, then you have that person in place, they're maximized, they're loving their life and their job and they're taking care of all those unhappy customers and turning them around and you don't have to do it. So that's a maximized team effort. And so as a leader, it's important to know who I am, what I bring, what I do, but then what, you know, and I'm gonna lead differently than the people around me, but then also like, what do I need to put in place? I need to be very self-aware of what I'm not so that I'm putting all those other things in place to make sure I'm not dropping the ball in those other areas. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Does that make sense to the rest of you? Do you all agree with that approach? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm absorbing. Yeah. Takes a while to process it. Can you go back towards the bottom, uh, Brandy? Yes, yes. So one thing I did notice, and, and I heard Gerald actually say it, it's true for me as well. When you think about ideation, woo, communication, that to me, is, there's a lot of marketing in that. That's right. I heard, I heard Gerald say that, you know, he doesn't do a very good job of marketing. Yeah. I'm the same way. I, I, I'm not a marketer. I'm not a creator. I, yeah. In fact, I've told, I've told many people, if you're, if you're looking for me to come up with a new idea, that's not me. Mm -hmm. You come up with the idea, I'll execute it, right? That's so right. So it's just, it's just something that struck me that you and I both have got in common there, Gerald. Yeah. Yep. And, and you're absolutely right, guys. Woo, communication, positivity, those three, they're found together 50% of the time. And they're, they're all in the bottom for you guys, as well as that ideation, which is very good at marketing. So again, that just goes, well, I'm not good at marketing. Let me outsource it. Let me hire somebody. Let me get a partner. Put something in place that does all the marketing for me. Yep. Mm -hmm. And her name would be Kim. <laughs> 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 I was going to say that's the best part <laughs> yeah um, anything else we've, we've taken up a whole hour here so we've covered a lot of ground anything else that you guys wanted to share about your strengths or anything else anybody wants to ask no I'm, I'm good thank yeah you. great session thank you Brandy okay. Thank you, so Brittany. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining the, the Monday after Thanksgiving and when our bellies are full. I appreciate it. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful week. All right. You too. Take care now. Thank you so much. Talk to you all soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye.